In this video, I'll discuss some basic aspects of the lung ultrasound for the nephrologist. Important thing to note is that lung tissue is not seen on ultrasound unless the lung is consolidated or it's atelectatic. All you would see is artifacts. If you are seeing horizontal artifacts, which are called A lines, that means it's normal lung. If you are seeing vertical artifacts, which are called B lines, they indicate increased extravascular lung water. And this is how a normal lung looks like on ultrasound. The bright shimmering line here is the pleural line and it's a combination of parietal and visceral pleura and the shimmer represents pleural sliding, which is normal. And here you have rib shadows because bones and stones give acoustic shadowing on ultrasound. So this space here is one intercostal space or one rib interspace. These horizontal bright lines which are essentially reflections of the pleural line are the A lines. And when you see A lines, it's normal lung. And when you are looking for these artifacts, make sure that you have a depth of at least 10 to 12 centimeters. Mechanistically, A lines are reverberation artifacts. When the initial ultrasound waves uh, hit pleural line and reflected back, a pleural line is depicted on the ultrasound monitor. But some of the ultrasound waves are reflected back and forth between the pleural line and the face of the probe because of the underlying air in the lung which is reflective to ultrasound and each of these reflected waves take longer time to go back to the probe and for the ultrasound uh, machine time is equal to distance which means the longer something takes uh, to reach back to the probe the deeper the machine thinks a structure is so you have these multiple uh, equidistantly placed reflections of pleural line which are called a lines and this is how B lines look like. So B lines are vertical hyperechoic artifacts arising from the pleural line and extending to the bottom of the screen. Again, ensure that you have adequate depth of at least 10 centimeters to 12 centimeters. Otherwise, you can have some short path reverberation artifacts which can be confused with B lines. So B lines essentially look like sun rays and they signify increased extravascular lung water. And B lines mechanistically are ring down artifacts. When the interlobular septae are thickened, uh, presumably with fluid, you have a unique air water interface uh, formed there. So you have this thickened interlobular septum because of fluid and it is surrounded by air bubbles. It forms a tetrahedron kind of model. And when you hit that with ultrasound waves, uh, air is very reflective to ultrasound and fluid is a good transmitter. So because of that, ultrasound beam bounces back and forth within the fluid and each time it bounces, it produces a small um, um, horizontal artifact and multiple of these horizontal artifacts combine to form a vertical B line. Technique of the lung ultrasound, you can use either a curvilinear transducer that is the abdominal probe or a phase direct transducer that is a cardiac probe to perform lung ultrasound, especially when you are looking at A lines and B lines. If you want to look at plural characteristics closely, then you use a high frequency probe that is a linear probe. And uh, there are specific zones of sono auscultation where you want to put the probe, uh, which I will show in the next slides. But the important thing is that wherever you put the probe, it has to be perpendicular to the chest wall. Uh, that's why you have to pay attention to the curvature of the chest wall and the and place the probe accordingly, because otherwise you wouldn't get a good artifact pattern. There are several zones of sono auscultation or areas of lung ultrasound assessment that have been described in the literature. The general principle is that the more symptomatic a patient is, you can auscultate less number of zones. For example, if a dialysis patient comes to the ER with shortness of breath, you are just auscultating one zone on um, each lung and you find B lines, you can assume that the patient is fluid overloaded. On the other hand, if you are adjusting dry weight on a chronic dialysis patient, who is uh, essentially asymptomatic, then you want to sono auscultate more zones. So 28 zone ultrasound was the one that has been traditionally described in nephrology related literature in dialysis patients. So it involves auscultating each rib intercostal space. This is typically done using a phased array probe because it has a small uh, mouth and you put you put phased array probe in each rib intercostal space and uh, along the parasternal line 
mid clavicular line, anterior axillary line, and mid axillary line on each side. On the right side, you auscultate from um, second intercostal space to fifth intercostal space, and on the left side, you sono auscultate from second intercostal space to fourth intercostal space. You sono auscultate one less zone on the left uh, because of the heart interference. It might not be always possible to perform a 28 zone lung ultrasound even when the patient is asymptomatic. That's why it's important to know the abbreviated techniques that have been described in the literature, primarily in the context of heart failure. And recently, eight zone lung ultrasound method has uh, shown to retain prognostic significance compared to 28 zone lung ultrasound in dialysis patients. So this involves uh, dividing each ch chest uh, both right and left chest into two anterior zones and two lateral zones, taking parasternal line, anterior axillary line, and posterior axillary lines as your arbitrary um, divisions. And you draw another line just below the nipple or at the level of nipple. Uh, that way you get total four zones on each side. And this is further abbreviated four zone uh, protocol where you just auscultate one anterior zone and one lower lateral zone. Basically, zone one and zone four of eight zone method constitutes four, four zone method of zone auscultation. In general, presence of more than 0.5 B line per uh, intercostal space on an average is considered abnormal. Obviously, you can have like half B line, but it's on an average out of those uh, eight zones, you take the average number of B lines. If it's more than uh, 0.5, that's um, significant. It's important to note that B lines always do not equal to pulmonary edema. They can be seen in other conditions such as pulmonary fibrosis where interlobular septa are thickened and they can also be seen in uh, pulmonary contusion in a patient with trauma or you can also see B lines in a patient with pneumonia. So caution needs to be exercised and in most of these conditions the pleural line tends to be irregular uh, because of the underlying disease. So, as mentioned before, if you want to assess the pleural characteristics more closely, you would want to use a linear transducer or the vascular probe. So, with vascular probe, with the less depth and higher resolution, um, you can see the nice shimmer of the pleural line. This is normal pleural line, uh, which is sliding, and these are ribs, and rib shadows will be here. And you can see one A line here. And this image uh, was obtained from a patient with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and ANCA associated vasculitis with kidney failure. Here you, you see B lines which appear as if there is a um, lot of fluid, um, but the pleural line is very irregular and significantly thickened compared to the previous image you saw. Now you put a linear probe and see uh, the pleural characteristics, you can clearly note that the pleural line is very irregular. Here also you can see that it's very irregular, suggesting that these B lines are probably not cardiogenic, but most likely pneumogenic. But a patient with underlying pulmonary fibrosis can still have uh, um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You can't always rule that out just by looking at pleural line irregularities. That's where advanced focus uh, techniques such as being able to assess diastolic function of the heart come handy. And Pleural sliding uh, is important to know because absent pleural sliding can signify pneumothorax. This is the normal sliding lung. You see this nice uh, shimmer of the pleural line. And here you see the junction between the non-sliding lung and the sliding lung. That's called a lung point. A lung point is very specific for pneumothorax. If you just rely on just absent sliding, you can have absent sliding just because the patient is not breathing. You can uh, check it on your cells. You put the probe and stop breathing you will not see good uh, shimmering nature of the pleural line. So uh, when you see this junction of normal and abnormal lung, it's definitely significant for pneumothorax. It's particularly important after you place a central line. You don't, you don't always need to get a chest x-ray after a uh, central line if you want to rule out pneumo pneumothorax. Air rises uh, in the chest, so pneumothorax is expected to see in the upper anterior zones. You carefully sono auscultate uh, the upper anterior zones. Uh, and uh, if you don't find any lung point or non-sliding pleura, that means there is um, there is no pneumothorax. And pleural effusion. You sono auscultate for pleural effusion in the lower lateral zone because that's where the fluid is expected to accumulate. 
and on sonographic image this is how it appears like fluid is black on ultrasound so any effusion must be black so here we have an image uh, of the right lung here you can see the liver and this brighter uh, structure is diaphragm and this is uh, towards head and this is towards feet because the probe orientation marker when you are doing lung ultrasound is typically uh, towards patient's head unless you are doing a transfer scan. And uh, here you can see all fluid which is pleural effusion and here you can see some shadows. These shadows are coming from um, the thoracic vertebrae. Normally, when the lung is filled with air, you do not see any vertebral column above the diaphragm level. But if you are seeing vertebral column above the diaphragm, there must be some effusion or a complete uh, lobar consolidation. So this is called the spine sign or thoracic spine sign. And most of the time when you have such significant pleural effusion, you will see something floating um, within the effusion which corresponds to the atelectatic lung because all, there is always some degree of compressive atelectasis when you have pleural effusion that's called a whale tail sign or some people call it jellyfish sign and uh, note that there are some uh, bright pearly structures inside the atelectatic lung they just correspond to uh, air bronchograms or trapped air remember air is white on ultrasound so these are called static air bronchograms because they typically do not move with respiration. The entire lung moves, the collapsed lung moves, but these, uh, these bright dots do not move independently. That's why they are static. It's important to note that because in pneumonia, you can have dynamic air bronchograms which move with uh, respiration. And here is an example of pneumonia where um, this uh, person is sliding the transducer in the lateral aspect from top to bottom. And here you can see all this A-line pattern and suddenly you see a break or a shredded area of subpleural consolidation. So that's called shred sign where you have all this bright air lining up the irregular uh, area of the subpleural consolidation. And in the same picture you can also see all this hepatized lung here above the diaphragm that signifies lobar consolidation. And uh, here is another nice example of lobar consolidation which initially appears like there is pleural effusion and maybe atelectatic lung but these bright dots or air bronchograms are mobile. These are dynamic air bronchograms which signifies pneumonia. Again, you have to interpret the focus findings in the right clinical context. Uh, this patient is likely to have fever and leukocytosis and maybe other signs suggestive of infection. So that's all for now. Happy scanning. Thank you.